welcome this large group to this very special event. This occasion was planned by the advisory council of the college, as I indicated out at the naming of the building, which is comprised of some 30 business, civic, religious labor leaders of the community, together with the faculty, staff, and student body of this organization. When we were talking about it, getting this ready, we were naturally wondering what our attendance would be. I can assure you we're overwhelmed to see the large group that is here, the many friends that we have for Jay and Afton Nelson is indeed most pleasing. I would like to introduce that table, have the invocation, and then of course we will proceed with our dinner. We will have them stand as I announce them. Please remain standing, those at the head table, and then please save your response till the, they're all introduced. At my far right is Mr. O.N. Malmquist. And Mrs. O.N. Malmquist, our very able vice chairman of our committee here. Next is Mrs. Homer Durham and Commissioner Homer Durham. Next we have Mrs. George Hatch and Mr. George Hatch. Next is Mrs. Calvin Rampton and our Governor Calvin Rampton. Now we'll be hearing from all these folks during the evening. They just won't let us sit together. I don't know what that means. They got me on one side of the podium and my wife on the other. My wife, Nadine Gunn. Next is our man we're honoring tonight, President Jay Nelson and his wife, Afton. <laughs> Next we have a man we have heard from in the dedication of those that might have been late this building, by the way, which was the first building constructed on this campus, was this fine administration building. And tonight has been very ably named with an unveiling of the J.L. Nelson Administration Building. And the man performing that, of course, was the chairman of the State Board of Education, Mr. Robert Wright and his wife. All right, next we have Superintendent uh, Walter D. Talbot and Mrs. Talbot. She'll be here. All right, fine. She's coming. Good. And next, uh, Mr. Ted Bird, our student body president, his wife was unable to be here. Would you please give them a <laughs> I guess this is the time of reminiscence, of honors, and uh, our president who has been the man's been the president of an institution for 25 years, you might say he's uh, somewhat around the middle age, uh, we could be said. Someone said on middle age, middle age is when your memory is shorter, your experience longer, stamina lower, and your forehead higher. The invocation will now be given by the Commissioner, Mr. Homer Durham. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank thee for the privilege of our health and strength and being able to gather here tonight in the J.L. Nelson Administration Building of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. We feel to express our thanks for the many supporters, the universal support which this institution receives from the people of Utah for the dedicated service of the State Board of Vocational Education, the Advisory Council, the Board of Regents, and all who serve and mobilize support for this important institution. On this occasion, we have particular gratitude for its development over the years, and that tonight we are met to honor President Nelson, who for a quarter of a century has led this institution, developed this new campus, 
while maintaining a very vital and valuable service on the downtown campus in Salt Lake City nearby. We ask thy blessings to be upon this institution, upon the fruits of its labors. We realize the importance it has in the lives of men and women in the economy of this state, providing useful jobs and employment of productive capacity for the benefit of all upon which we all depend so much from day to day. We ask thy blessing now upon the proceedings of this evening, all who participate. May joy and happiness be with President and Mrs. Nelson and all their associates who labor here. And may thy blessing be upon the food we are about to take of, for which we thank thee with the gratitude of our hearts and lives. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. We would like to make one special presentation at this time before we eat, and that'll be done by Mrs. Rampton. It is more than fitting that one of the first things done in the newly named J.L. Nelson Administration Building is the recognition of a lady who I'm sure is dear to all of the students and the faculty and the administrators of this college, Afton Nelson. <laughs> I'm sure that's with the love of everyone. Oh, oh some beautiful long stemmed roses. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Your attention, please. As I was listening to that melodious music, I heard my wife and Jane Nelson trying to name the tunes, and they were doing pretty good, too, I thought. I asked my wife to waltz, and it's the same old story, you know, no go, man, you understand. No, she wouldn't waltz with me. And so I asked Governor Rampton, who I've no one not to call Cal, do you know those tunes? He says, not only do I know the music, I know the words. We would like to have these people who have played this delightful dinner music stand up, Mr. and Mrs. Cal and Jean Beecher, and let's have them stand and give them applause. Governor Rampton is listed down on the program, and he has, uh, has to leave for another assignment, and so we're going to move the program ahead. <clears throat> Someone says, a good politician is one who gets in the public eye without irritating it. Now, I think this is true of Cal Rampton. Most of you know that on this campus, we have a building named for Calvin Rampton. I think this is a credit to our governor and to the fact that he has been a great supporter of vocational education. <laughs> now, uh, I was in the Army Reserve, and I've, this is where I knew Jay Nelson, among other places. And Cal and I were talking, and he is, he is a, a retired colonel, our governor. Now, Jay is only a lieutenant colonel. And uh, Cal, uh, I wonder if you've ever had to give any orders now to this uh, man we're honoring tonight. Our governor, Calvin Rampton. Please sit down, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the only virtue I've ever been able to see in the archaic custom of standing up for the chief executive is it does give your dinner a chance to settle. And if it serves that purpose, I guess it's worthwhile. I'm 
deeply grateful that I was given an opportunity to participate on this program tonight to pay tribute to Jay and to this institution. I've been closely connected with this institution for a long time, as I have been with Jay. In fact, my first acquaintance with both of them occurred at about the same time, in the spring of the year 1948, I believe it was, when my boss, uh, the attorney, then Attorney General of the State of Utah, Grover Giles, called me in and said the state is beginning a new trade tech institution, we called it then, and uh, we've made, or the Board of Examiners has made tentative plans to take under a lease purchase uh, option the Troy Laundry Building on 6th East and 4th South. <clears throat> and uh, Grover told me I was to go over see Governor Ma and to get the details and to see if I could work out the lease. And that's uh, when I first became acquainted with Jay. He wasn't the president then. He was sort of the man of all work around the uh, then sort of uh, an embryo staff of the institution. But at any rate, <clears throat> we did get the uh, purchase made. We did lease it. The purchase option was exercised, and the building served the institution for a lot longer than any of us believed that it would at the time the lease was entered into. I next, uh, I left the Attorney General's office that year and next, of course, had a responsibility in regard to this institution in January of 1965 when this campus was started. Now, Hodd has said that this building that we're now in was the first building on the campus. That is not technically true. The first building on the campus was the heating plant. We beat, built the heating plant because that's how much money there was, because uh, we wanted to get started, and even though there was nothing to heat, we did build it. Uh, <laughs> paradoxically, at the same time, we had on one of the other campuses of higher education in this state, I'm not sure, President Higby, whether it was Snow or the College of Eastern Utah, but we had a building there completed, but with no heat. We worked on that problem for quite some time, but we never did solve it. It would have taken so many miles of uh, steam pipe to have solved the problem that we gave up and gave you a heat plant of your own out there. But at any rate, the recent years have seen the development of a campus here of which I believe this state can well be proud. It was the intention and has proved to be the accomplishment of the State Building Board to build a campus here which could be the pride of the faculty and the students here attending. You know, a decade ago when this campus was really getting started, there still existed in the mind of the populace sort of a social stigma attached to technical education. And it was the determination of the building board and also of the uh, board of uh, vocational education and later of the board of higher education that no campus in the state should exceed in beauty and in functionalism this campus here. And I believe that has been achieved. Certainly no student here or no faculty member could believe after seeing the beauty of both the landscaping and the buildings here that in any way does this state regard as secondary in importance in post high school education or institutions of technical education. In Indeed, these are beautiful buildings, and I'm pleased that you have named this building for Jay. As uh, Hodge stated a few minutes ago, uh, 
The Technology Building just west of here was named the Rampton uh, Technology Building. However, Jay, when uh, they were introducing you this evening, they said the fact that uh, you have a building named after you means that uh, they're saying to you, you now have tenure. I believe they're also saying don't overdo it because <laughs> When in the spring of 1972, you very graciously recommended to the Board of uh, Vocational Education that they name the building next door, the Rampton Technology Building, everybody nodded that that was a good idea, but nothing happened. It didn't move with the speed with which the proposal uh, to name this building the Nelson Building moved. In fact, the proposal dragged on months and months until after the uh, 5th of November, and when it moved uh, rather rapidly. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I think we got the message. But it is a beautiful campus, and one of which we can be proud, and I think that I can speak for not only the state administration, legislature, but also for the representatives of the boards who will be speaking here this evening when I say that we are dedicated to improving technical education. A decade ago, only about 5% of the total budget for post-high school education in this state went for technical education. That percentage is now more than doubled and the base figure to which it applies is more than three times what it was then. So the total amount, annual amount now in a decade has increased by six times. And I would hope that it'll continue to increase because I would much prefer to produce an educational system which equips people to take a job in being, to make a contribution of the, to the economy, and yet to have the opportunity for sufficient academic subjects to give them an enriched curriculum. That is what we've tried to do here, not to make academics to not to emphasize academics to the degree where it could swallow up the technical aspect, which it can do if you don't watch it, to make, to, to make sure that there were sufficient academic subjects available so that the students here could feel that they had an enriched program. And this, I believe, has been accomplished, not only this institution has flourished, but also its sister institution down at, uh, now at Provo, soon to move to uh, Orem. I see uh, President Sorensen out here in the audience. I've told uh, some of you before how they got the money for uh, the technical, or for the Orem campus, I just got tired of my phone ringing all hours of the night with calls from Wilson Sorensen, and I had to do something in self-defense. He's the most persistent man I've ever seen in my life. But at any rate, there is being constructed down there a sister organization to this. I'm glad to see the friendly rivalry that exists between the two as the people that uh, uh, Orem refer to this as Taylorsville Tech. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, before long, as you achieve a uh, new distinction, Wilson, uh, an appropriate term will be found uh, uh, by this institution to apply to you. Jay, I would like to commend you on the basis of the years of association that we have had together in this field. I would like to commend you not only for your dedication to technical education, 
but to your ability in the field of technical education and in the field of educational administration, largely as a result of your efforts, this institution has grown from that uh, leased building on 4th South and 6th East, which uh, we had to wash the windows on before we could even get the light in so we could see inside to this beautiful structure. And if ever there was a, an institution in this entire state that had the stamp of one man on it, it is this institution. I think it might have been more appropriate rather than to name this building the J.L. Nelson Administration Building, to name this the Nelson Technical College. On another occasion, I had the opportunity to introduce Governor Rampton shortly after he was elected governor. It was at the downtown campus. The State Road Commission there was holding a seminar, and they asked me if I would extend the words of greeting on behalf of the institution and introduce the governor of the state of Utah. And I said I'd be happy to do that. Well, the first portion went very well, and then I said, it's now my pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of Utah, George Dewey Clyde. <laughs> I remember Governor Rampton, I blushed, begged your pardon, and sat down. And you, in your very responsive manner then, stood up and said, President Sorensen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank very much the Governor, Miss Rampton, for being with us. Someone has says, made this statement that we taxpayers no longer fear that Congress will let us down. We would be happy if they would let us up. Most of us have friends, buddies, or sometimes they say in Washington, cronies. Now we're happy to have as a special occasion here, some of the friends or cronies or buddies of Jay Nelson. They're not on the program, and we're going to call on them now for some remarks of the more intimate things about Jay Nelson. And we'll start off with Bert Willis. Great privilege to be here and represent a number of re reserve officers in the uh, U.S. Army. We first became associated with Jay back in the early 50s or the late 40s, and uh, we were together in a group headquarters. I happened to be the executive officer. Jay happened to be the operations officer. Our commanding officer then was Horace Shirtliff, succeeded by Alan Aikum. Um, 25 years since then are uh, too long to span, but I would just like to relate one or two incidents which uh, indicate uh, the side of uh, Jay's nature, which uh, many of us, uh, and perhaps he, would like to forget. <laughs> At summer camp, we saw the progress of the uh, technical college and uh, we had a chance to uh, see some of the progress as it developed, but we also had some uh, other activities which uh, are perhaps uh, equally memorable. In the year 1956, we happened to be together, for instance, in Camp Roberts, 
and uh, Jay had been out on the range uh, lining up the firing, come back entirely bushed that night, and he flopped out on the bed and fell asleep in his uniform, and uh, he was uh, set for the night, apparently. But uh, he looked so peaceful there that we thought we'd decorate him up a little bit. We got a can of uh, shaving soap and decorated his uniform, and his hand was uh, laying down by his side. We filled that full of uh, soap, and then we wanted to uh, put just a little bit on his forehead and nose, and he thought a, a fly hit him, so up with the hand to his face, and it smeared the shaving soap all over the place. Well, the other officers were uh, quietly enjoying this, and uh, Jay uh, didn't uh, enjoy the merriment so much. He went off to shave and plotted a, a drastic uh, revenge. And uh, the next morning at 5.30, he did something which I've never heard of being done in the Army. He uh, set up a couple of these Jerry bombs, these M80 firecrackers, and tossed them into his commanding officer's bedroom and under the bed of the executive officer. They went off, there must have been at least a half a dozen of them, and they lifted the beds of these worthy officers six inches off the floor. It broke the tiles loose under the bed and also on the ceiling, and it almost ended up in a report to the commanding general because there were some non-Utah officers there that took a very dim view of that. <laughs> But along with the hijinks, I should mention that uh, Jay Nelson as operations officer, although he took a few gigs on having the field problems too realistic, uh, uniformly had top ranking and superior ratings for our unit as operations officer. I'm happy in behalf of the officers of our group and the other officers who are located here to extend Jay our Congratulations and our best wishes at this time. And next we'll hear from Bob Springmeyer. We kind of got things a little out of order here. Uh, they asked me if I'd say a few words. Uh, about why uh, maybe Jay likes to uh, fish and hunt. I have been known on occasion to uh, journey with him to the far uh, parts of the Intermountain West. Uh, I would say in determining why he liked to hunt and fish, I would say, does a fish uh, like water? Uh, I think really if Jay were to miss uh, one of the openings for the fishing or the hunting season, uh, something drastic would happen, like the, uh, the geese would stop uh, flying uh, south in the fall or some uh, earth-shaking thing of that nature. Uh, it certainly would be an unusual occurrence. Uh, I would say that uh, characteristic uh, of Jay in connection with his hunting and fishing is uh, one would be his eternal optimism. Uh, always where the next is going to be the biggest fish or you're going to see a fabulous number of roosters or, well, you just can't imagine. Determination. I have never seen an individual that is more determined and uh, he does uh, succeed with his determination, and he does enjoy himself thoroughly. Uh, I don't know that uh, I have ever seen in an individual that uh, really has more joy in connection with his activities. He thoroughly does enjoy himself. Now, one thing that all of you employees of the uh, college here can be thankful of, 
and that would be that uh, perhaps it's to your advantage that he takes some of his frustrations out on those poor defenseless birds and uh, not entirely upon you. The, uh, in recent years, I think Jay is uh, of necessity perhaps had to uh, slow down a little bit, thank goodness. Uh, there was a time uh, when on some of these pheasant trips uh, in particular, if he would see a bird in the field, uh, he would be out of the car, over the fence, and running down that poor little bird uh, before I could even get my door open. And furthermore, uh, he would literally run them down. You have never seen a man that could run faster after those birds. Pity the poor rooster that was foolish enough to walk across an open field. Then think of the, all the years and the public service that Jay has offered by keeping and helping to control the population of the deer and the birds, the sage hens, and the big game. Without that, uh, I'm sure we would have had a population explosion. Does Jay like fishing and hunting? Well, if he doesn't, then fish don't like water. I really believe that he enjoys the fresh air, the exercise, and the scenery as, he much, uh, as much as he actually likes the shooting of the game. In some ways, I really think we are like Indians. Uh, or, in my opinion, in our Intermountain West here, we have truly found the happy hunting ground right here on Earth. And to me, when we get out on a trip, and uh, particularly when he gets me up at those ungodly hour, uh, hours of the morning, and uh, when I do view the horizon and the sun comes up, then I like to think of the song that on a clear day you can see forevermore. It is really, truly a beautiful experience, and I would say, in all honesty, Jay is just a tremendous hunter and fisherman. Thank you. Finally, we'll hear from Mr. Kirby Kirkham. You may think that you know Jay Nelson, but as a friend of neighbor, let me tell you a few things that you might not know. I met Jay some 32 years ago when we were Army officers headed for the Philippine Islands on the USS George Kershaw. And I heard there was a young officer on board from Spanish Fork. His name was Killer Nelson. He was the National Guard boxing champion. Well, in the two weeks we were on board that ship, I got to know and appreciate Killer and find out that the name was completely unlike the person. Well, in Tacloban we separated, but imagine our delight when some years later we found when we moved into our new home that Jay and his lovely wife Afton and their fine family only lived some 200 yards from where we did. Now if you want to know a man, you should be his neighbor. You'll see him in his best clothes, you'll see him at his best, you'll see him at his worst, you'll see him in his grubby clothes when he's cutting the lawn or shoveling snow. And when you live by someone for 28 years and you have the tragedies and the happiness that comes to every neighborhood, you truly do get to know the good neighbor. And this to me is Jay Nelson. You know, when uh, something goes right and a kind word is in order, Jay was there. And when tragedy struck and you needed someone who knew the proper words to say and the things to do, again, it was Jay. In the course of this long friendship I've had with this wonderful man, I found out that two times he had run for office and not been elected. One time he missed being the student body president of the Provo High School by a mere eight votes, 
And then later, he lost the election as student body president of BYU by five votes. When I heard this, my opinion of the two schools naturally lessened considerably. <laughs> but be that as it may, on those important things, the elections and the things that count, Jay's always been a winner. He's especially proud, but he won't tell too many people, that he served as two, consec two consecutive terms as president for the Viking Social Unit. And to Jay, the most important election of his life that he won was when he was president of the freshman class. And the vice president of that class was Afton. And the two of them together found out that they were an unbeatable team, and they still are. And you might be interested to know that yesterday it was their 38th wedding anniversary. Now, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, in 28 years you get to know and truly love a remarkable man, a lovely woman, and a fine family. And if we were to conduct a poll or have an election in our neighborhood this very day, as to who is our favorite neighbor, the man we want to share the rest of our life being around, it would be unanimous. It's the man we honor here tonight, Jay Nelson. Jay. Thank you, gentlemen. Well said and interesting. I don't know whether you noticed or not, when we introduced the head table, all we older fellows had our wives here. Did you notice who didn't bring his wife? The youngest guy here down here, our student body president. I want him to explain that. He's going to be next on our, our program. Ted Bird has been a very outstanding student body president. I've had the pleasure of knowing him. He has been on our advisory board. And maybe he learned from Jay Nelson. So what did he do when he was student body president? He married the sophomore president. Diane Howard, who he doesn't have here tonight, who he's going to explain the situation. And now he has completed and got a certificate here. He's going up to Weber College. So the first part of our presentations will be our now former ex-student body president, Ted Bird. Thank you, Horace. Uh, don't sell me short, I've still got three days left. <laughs> uh, my wife couldn't make it tonight. Uh, I really feel bad that she was ill. I'm sure she would have appreciated being here. There's really no excuses other than the fact that she's ill. And I hope President Nafton will see through this with me. Because Utah Tech is the school that it is, training students in the field of vocational education, I am very pleased tonight present to the school on behalf of the Associated Students and the College Center this painting that is over to your right. And at this time, we would like to unveil this painting for all of you to display, put on display for all of you. I think it's very beautiful. This painting, for those of you who would like to see this hanging on its proper place, will dis be displayed in the College Center in what is now called the East Room. I am sure that it will be there within the next week if you're interested. I would like to say that we feel very good about this painting because it does signify a man who has dedicated himself to the school and to the purpose of vocational education. And for that reason tonight, we pay tribute to Jay Nelson. You know, when I first saw that uh, 
picture, it was in charcoal. And uh, I said to the gentleman who was the artist, Mr. Jordan, I said, Doug, couldn't you give me a little more hair? <laughs> and uh, several people saw it, heard me make that comment, and uh, they convinced me that the picture was just fine because they say that baldness is an indication of masculinity. Now, the only trouble is it lessens your opportunity to prove it. <laughs> but I would like to say that the gentleman who painted that portrait, Mr. Doug Jordan, graduated from Utah Technical College in 1956 from the Commercial Art Department. Following that, he had extensive study other places, has been employed as an instructor here at Utah Tech for the past several years, and he does a magnificent job. Thrilled about it, Doug. Thank you. Would this gentleman please stand up? Is this, is this the artist here? Would you please stand up? Well, Jay, talking about what you're saying about hairlines, they, someone has said life may begin at 40, but so does arthritis and lumbago. We have heard from, Jay has two bosses. One of them we heard from who gave that very fine invocation, G. Homer Durham, the Commissioner of Higher Education. Now we are going to hear from his other boss, Walter D. Talbot, who is superintendent of the Utah State Department of Public Instruction. I see you got your wife here finally. Uh, well. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and participate on this occasion in honoring Jane Nelson. He's been with the institution 25 years. I've been with it about half that long. And it's been a pleasure all the way, I assure you, in working with Jay. It's my pleasure to present to him a couple of citations. If I can get him to stand up here, I'll let you judge uh, which one of us has the most hair. The first citation is from Governor Rampton. I'd like to read to you, addressed to J.O. Nelson, the president of Utah Technical College of Salt Lake. Dear Jay, it has been my observation that one of the true satisfactions of life is setting an objective and seeing it accomplished. If that be a condition for satisfaction and happiness, I am confident you, as much as anyone I know, have achieved this goal. Your dedication to the cause of vocational and technical training in the state of Utah for a quarter of a century has been the stimulus for bringing this phase of education from a crude and rudimentary form to the effective and efficient system which Utah presently enjoys. The validity of your efforts in standing for support of vocational education and training in a steadfast and strong fashion despite many discouraging periods, in a, is a test of your belief in this worthwhile cause. There is no question but what the state of Utah and its citizens are deeply indebted to you for your dedication to this effort. The value of this form of education in terms of aiding Utah's economy is so well known that it seems unnecessary to underscore the great economic contribution which your dedication has produced. My sincere and heartiest congratulations on this noteworthy achievement of 25 years of service in this significant and important field of education. Sincerely, Calvin L. Rampton, Governor. Congratulations, John. In the next citation, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to, to read. Address to J.L. Nelson, President, Utah Technical College, Salt Lake City. Dear Dr. Nelson, I am happy to congrat congratulate you on your 25th year as President of Utah Technical College. Your students, friends, and fellow faculty members 
all share an equal admiration for the leadership you have given this fine institution. Our society is richer for the hundreds of young people who have found meaningful and satisfying occupations through the inspired guidance you provided by creating for them a truly effective learning environment. I salute your foresight, your perseverance, and your ability to adapt to change so as to meet the most current needs of your students and of our business and industrial community. I hope that you will find it gratifying to look back on two and a half decades of such rewarding work, and I send you my very best wishes for the future. Sincerely, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States. Okay. I have mentioned to you that the Advisory Council is composed of some 30 persons in the field of business, religion, education, labor. And we've had a very fine vice chairman. She's very able. She comes to all the meetings and doing an excellent job in the scholarship program for this college. It is my pleasure to next introduce Mrs. O.N. Florence Momquist. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time it is my privilege to present a gift to President and Mrs. Nelson. I say President and Mrs. Nelson because I like to think that during the 25 years of his service to the school, that because of her sharing, the difficulties have been divided and the successes have been multiplied. We, his advisory council, recognize in President Nelson a guiding light, a leader, a dedicated administrator, administrator, and we esteem his efficiency and we salute his diplomacy in handling difficult situations. In fact, we just love him. It is my pleasure to present to them at this time a lovely gift from all of you, his friends. Look what we have for you. This silver tray with the pitcher and goblets is inscribed on the tray the following. Presented by friends of J.L. and Afton Nelson, an appreciation dinner June 3rd, 1975, honoring him on his 25 years as president of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake, December 1st, 1949 till June 3rd, 1975. Thank you. Next uh, presentation will be my, by Mr. George C. Hatch, Chairman, Utah State Board of Regents. Mr. Hatch. Not the least of Jay's accomplishments has been for the last 11 years he has had to survive the hurdle of presenting his budgets and curriculum proposals to committees of which I have been chairman. And I congratulate Jay on his perseverance and the results we see here tonight. Along with the very fine letters which have previously been presented to you from the president and the governor, Jay, we have collected uh, 32 among the many letters that have come on this anniversary, including letters from the, your eight fellow presidents of the other colleges and universities in the state, presidents of BYU, Westminster College, heads of the Alumni Association, student body, non-teaching professionals, teachers association, the many groups you've worked with. And we hope that this bound volume of letters will be a remembrance to you of this occasion. Congratulations. 
I have a resolution here I'd like to read, which I have signed as the Chairman of the Advisory Council, which says, whereas it is the desire of the Advisory Council of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake to perpetuate the name of J.L. Nelson upon the 25th anniversary of his presidency of the college, and whereas a significant method of achieving this goal is to institute a scholarship in the name of President J.L. Nelson to be granted to a worthy and deserving student. Now, therefore, be it resolved that an annual scholarship be established in per perpetuity at this college, covering full tuition and fees, and administered through the Financial Aids Office. Signed this the 30 day of June, 1975, third day of June. Signed by the Chairman of the Advisory Council. It's my privilege now to present this to Jay and to hear from our honored guest, Dr. J. L. Nelson. Twenty-five years. Wow. I'm a senior citizen. But I want you to know that I have warm blood. It's just unfortunate that it's in such an old container. <laughs> Twenty-five years is a long time, and I've asked myself many times in recent weeks how my colleagues could possibly have put up with me for that long. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that Dr. Nelson salutation. I thought perhaps uh, you were addressing my son, Jerry. You know, many individuals have called me doctor for many years. I would that I could uh, claim that distinction. But I believe over the years I've developed an appropriate response. You see, I'd much rather have people say, why isn't he, than how the devil did he get to be one? Well, my apologies to my colleagues who hold that distinction. There are so many things that I could say about the institution in the 25 years that uh, I have served as its leader. With your permission, I'd like just to share a few of the choice experiences that have occurred during our journey down memory lane. You know, as in 47, when the legislature established this college, classes started in 48. We didn't have enough money to transform that old laundry building into an adequate classroom situation. So we erected the walls eight feet high. The ceilings were 14 feet. And I can recall when uh, the students in the barbering department and the business department used to communicate with each other by tossing notes over the wall. When the college first started, our faculty was comprised of 16 individuals. My office then was about the size of my present office. And we used to hold our faculty meetings weekly in my office. Today, we need to use the auditorium in the technology building. Well, one of the first challenges I recall we had, and I see our old chairman of the Area Board of Control there, M. Elmer Christensen, one of the first challenges we had was to fill the manure troughs in the old laundry building, which was then the horse barn of the Troy Laundry. We had to fill those manure troughs in order to level the floor sufficiently to install the welding equipment. And it didn't take us long after that to transform the hay lofts into classrooms. And I remember the first shocking experience we ever had. You know, the old Troy Laundry building used tremendous sized boilers to heat the water for the laundry. They used to heat the building with the same system. Those boilers truly were colossal. We had a giant of a man who was a building engineer. And he would light the boilers each morning with a long stemmed match. Well, one morning when he inserted the match, the doggone thing exploded. And it broke every window in that section of the building, 
picked up this large building engineer and tossed him about 15 yards against a brick wall. Fortunately, he wasn't seriously hurt. One of the most trying experiences uh, that we ever had at that campus, the downtown campus, the Troy Laundry campus, came about during a tremendous rainstorm. I thought about this this afternoon. The rain came down in torrents, and the sewer line between 4th and 5th South on 6th East some way became clogged, and it wouldn't handle that drainage. Well, after a little while, the water started backing up into the basement of the old laundry building, and it came up through the drain there in the building, and in about two hours, we had two feet of sewage water on the floor of the machine shop. It took the city engineers overnight to find out that the tree roots along between 4th and 5th South there had clogged the sewage line and made the water back up. Well, you know, for two or three days, the uniform there at the college in the machine shop was hip boots and diving masks. And we had a smelly good time, I can assure you, for weeks. Well, in the 19 years that we used that downtown campus, we certainly developed it into a tremendous facility. I would say that we brought it up to a respectable standard. You know, when we first started to use the facility, we used it in conjunction with a dry cleaning establishment, a subsidiary of Brown, Terry, and Woodruff Corporation. Well, after having been affiliated with that dry cleaning establishment for several years, we learned a real lesson. We learned that pressing problems can be ironed out through determination and dedication. This college has had three names. In 1959, the State Board for Vocational Education changed the name from Salt Lake Area Vocational School to Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute. And it was that year when we dissolved the Area Board of Control, which had guided the college since its establishment in 1948. And then it was in 1967 when they again changed our name to Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. And it's sort of hard to realize that we have been known by that name now for the past eight years. This particular campus we're located on now was purchased in 1960. The portion of it that we pur purchased at that time was 74 and a half acres, and it cost $200,000. And some of you were here when we made our community debut by pulling down the old barn that was located approximately in the vicinity where we're seated this evening. And that was a very memorable occasion. This particular building was dedicated in 1967, and I'm proud to see the gentleman who did that job, Mr. Lynn S. Richards, who was chairman of the State Board for Vocational Education at that time. The Institute of Religion on campus was constructed soon after the second building came about. <clears throat> we have now on campus this building, then we constructed the Metal Trades Building, then the Auto Trades Building, then the Calvin L. Rampton Technology Building, then the College Center, and starting this fall, you will note another building rising to the west and slightly south out here where we have the recreational field. That will begin this fall. Bids will be opened on June 10th. Perhaps the incident that I recall most vividly on this particular campus was the dedication of the Calvin L. Rampton Technology Building. You know, the electronics department constructed an electronics instrument which was supposed to astound the audience. Well, at the appropriate moment, I gave the signal and absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> we received a jolting award from Call Radio for that occasion. Yes, it was the Lehman Lemon Award. <laughs> the growth and development of Utah Technical College has been a great challenge, as well as a very, very satisfying experience. 
And those whose tenure totaled 20 or more years with the institution have seen the growth skyrocket from 1,800 enthusiastic students in 1955 to over 6,000 students last fall in day and evening programs. Governor J. Bracken Lee played the devil's advocate in the development of this college. We all know that he vetoed the appropriation for the institution when he became governor. The Area Board of Control met with J. Bracken Lee many times during his tenure in office, and I might add without great financial success. Well, a couple of years ago, I was attending a boss's breakfast at the Hotel Utah. And as I sat down, I noticed Governor Lee sitting nearby. He smiled, stood up, walked toward me. We exchanged greetings, and after a very brief conversation, he said to me, Jay, your college has come a long way. You've succeeded in spite of me, haven't you? Well, naturally, that will be one of my choice memories. I'm very proud of the members of this great college, faculty and staff, and I want you to know that they are truly committed, committed to vocational technical education. We believe that the major thrust of the total system of education should be to prepare students for their life's work. Obviously, we don't think this should be the only thrust. We recognize that there is more to life than work, but we recognize too that there is really no truly good life without a good job. It's our intention to retain the identity of this institution. We want to keep it a vocational technical institution. It is truly a great vocational technical college. And I think it's making a significant contribution to the lives of the students who attend this institution. And I think it's making a significant contribution to the industrialization of the great state of Utah. And those who comprise the faculty and staff here are unusually capable and dedicated individuals. And together, I think we've made a great team. The growth and development of this college marks the culmination of a dream of many years by many individuals. It would be impossible for me to acknowledge all those who have helped develop and perpetuate this dream. And so, on behalf of the entire college, let me express our gratitude to members of the boards, members of the advisory council, members of the legislature, agencies and organizations, and those distinguished individuals who have provided the assistance, the encouragement, and the support for this college. And now, may I express my deep gratitude and appreciation to the advisory council and all of those who have honored me here tonight. Frankly, I'm overwhelmed at having a building named after me in, in recognition for service which I have rendered to a college which I truly love. <clears throat> and a portrait, well, really, it's <clears throat> something I've never dreamed of. Finally, may I express my love and appreciation to each of you for sharing with the Nelson family the salute which you have provided us this night. Thank you all from the very bottom of my heart. Thank you very kindly. 
I'm sure it would be amiss if I didn't take this opportunity to introduce to you my family, our family. Afton and I are very proud of them. Would you kindly stand as I introduce you? First, Dr. Gerald Nelson and his wife, Zeta. Jerry and Zeta reside in Connecticut. Jerry works for a economic firm entitled Research Data Data Resources. I'm sorry, Jerry, I've only said that 50 times. Next, number two son, Craig Scott Nelson and his wife, Beverly. Craig was the great cyclist. Some of you may recall a few years ago about a young man traveling 8,500 miles in one summer. Third son is Bruce J. Happy that he bears my name, and his wife, Jody. Bruce is a second year law student at Brigham Young University. And last, the caboose at the Nelson household was our daughter, Linda, who will be a senior at BYU next year. We're very proud of them. Thank you. Well, I think this has been a great evening, and we appreciate very much all of you attending. Uh, we would like you to remain seated for just a few minutes, and Jay and Afton will go out this door, and then any of you wish to greet them, you can do at that time. So we'll just wait a minute.